In 1934, Pastor Mike King went to the Holy Lands and then on to Germany in a pilgrimage with other Baptist pastors. He was powerfully affected by his pilgrimage, and when he returned to Atlanta, he announced to his family and his congregation that he was changing his name to Martin Luther. Well, he had a firstborn son named Michael, who was five years old, Michael Jr. Because his father changed his name, Mike knew that his name would change too. Smart kid at five years old. And Mike was not crazy about having his name changed. In fact, he resisted the legally changed name until he was 28 years old and didn't do it legally until 1957. Today, all the world knows him as Martin Luther King Jr. His closest friends and family always called him Mike until his death at 39. Today, on his actual 94th birthday, I would like to honor Mike King Jr. as we consider what he would do in times like the ones that we're living in. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. My friend and mentor, the Reverend Dr. Fred Shuttlesworth, told me over dinner in Birmingham, Alabama in 2004, when he first heard that a Baptist preacher had come from Boston University back to Alabama, and his name was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that he'd shown up at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Fred knew that he had to go to Montgomery and meet the man with the PhD. He said, I got in my car and I drove those 90 miles because I had never met a black man with a PhD in theology. So he walked into Dexter Avenue unannounced, greeted him and he said, now that I've met you, I can go home. And Martin <laughs> stopped him and said, let's talk a little more. The two would become great friends and Fred at 32 and Martin at 25 didn't know that the years that would unfold before them would change American history. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the right man in the right place at the right time to rise to leadership in Montgomery's bus boycott following the arrest of Miss Rosa Parks on December 1st, 1955. In the words of Esther, he was called for such a time as this. For 12 and a half years, Dr. King led our nation's most powerful nonviolent army and movement of men, women, teens, and children, the largest movement ever gathered to confront racial and economic injustice and inequality. All issues that had plagued our nation since the first African slaves were purchased in Virginia in August 1619. Until his dying breath on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, when he was assassinated on April 4, 1968, Mike was the key leader of the civil rights movement in America. He was a magnificent man. And as a boy of 10 years old growing up near Philadelphia, he was my hero. He was my inspiration of life, and he's the reason I sought ordained ministry. I wanted to be like Mike, only then I didn't know his name was Mike. <laughs> In December, all the contributing editors for the Columbus Dayton African American News Journal, of which I'm a part, were asked to, by our editor and publisher, Senator Ray Miller, to write for January's issue on the theme of what would Martin Luther King Jr. say today about politics and economics, about faith and children and family. I submitted my piece entitled, What Dr. King Would Say About America's Low Road Capitalism. In the remaining time this morning, I want to look at that, but I also want to look at what he would say, I believe, and what he would do about children and education, about inclusion and diversity. 
Let me say first how I would love for me to be sitting down there and to be listening to his aging, resonant voice this morning in our pulpit. As I think of Dr. King circa 2023, my mind goes in so many different directions because of the vastness of his mind and spirit. America's greatest preacher, and if you have a list that has somebody else as the greatest, forget it, I'm not gonna look at it. America's greatest pre preacher, our nation's, one of our nation's greatest philosophers, social analysts, liberation organizers, economic truth tellers, in the military industrial system, a democracy freedom fighter in a land we call home was one of a kind. We were blessed to have him walk the earth with us for 39 years, and we have experienced, every one of us, whether we know it or not, a deficit for having missed him for the last 55 years. What would he have to say about America's capitalistic economy in 2023. I believe he would analyze our economic system built on the backs of slaves. He would ask, as we should ask, why is it that the United States, when compared with other developed nations, has much greater inequality, no universal health care, low wages, high job insecurity, and a rotten social safety net. I believe Dr. King would come alongside the brilliant visionaries and authors in the 1619 Project and carry their writing forward as policy reconstruction. In his major article there, Matthew Desmond delivered a good label for the inequalities we have in the United States. He called it low road capitalism. Desmond explored the massive impact slavery has had on United States history. He said that many of the current ills in the United States can be traced straight back to the ways that slaves were exploited. Slavery enabled employers to impose harsh working conditions on slaves, but even after slaves were freed, there was a determined effort to not give them anything but the barest minimum. That impacted the entire society since the floor for treatment of workers was set so low. Dr. King would offer a clarion call to justice as he evaluated a capitalist society that goes low and wages are depressed as businesses compete over price and not the quality of goods. In addition, so-called unskilled workers are typically incentivized through punishments, not promotions, in low capitalism, inequality reigns and poverty spreads. He would gather research and statistics to present this case, he always did. In the United States, the richest 1% of Americans own 40% of our nation's wealth. That's an amazing statistic. While a large share, larger share of the working age people 18 to 65 live in poverty, larger share than in any other nation belonging to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Consider worker rights in different capitalist nations. In Iceland, 90% of wage and salaried workers belong to trade unions authorized to fight for living wages and fair working conditions. 34% of Italians are unionized, 26% of Canadians, and less than 10% of American wage and salaried workers carry union cards. The OECD scores nations along several indicators, such as how a country regularly uh, regulates its temporary work arrangements. Scores run from five, which is very strict, to one, which is very loose. Now, Brazil scores a, a 4.1, Thailand a 3.7, and so on and so forth. Further down the list, Norway at 3.4, India 2.5, Japan at 1.3, and the United States scores 0 0.3, tied for last place with Malaysia. So how is it, easy is it to fire workers in countries like Indonesia and Portugal? It's hard. Severance pay and reasons for dismissal are clear. Those rules lax somewhat are in places like Denmark and Mexico, but they disappear in the United States, virtually disappear. We rank dead last 
among 71 nations with a score of 0.5. Dr. King would take it one step further. He would agree that those searching for reasons for American economy is uniquely, why it's uniquely severe, have found their answers in places like religion and politics and culture. But recently, and persuasively, we've been pointing more specifically to the cotton fields of Georgia and Alabama, to the cotton houses and slave auction blocks as the birthplace for America's low road approach to capitalism. If today, America promotes a particular kind of low road capitalism, a union busting capitalism of poverty wages and gig jobs and normalized insecurity, a winner take all capitalism of stunning disparities, not only permitting but awarding financial rule bending, a racist capitalism that ignores the fact that slaves didn't just deny, weren't just denied their black freedom, but built white fortune as a result. All of this originated the wealth gap between black and white in this country. And at one point or another, we're going to need to own that. One reason is that American capitalism was founded right there on the lowest road. See, Dr. King would take the brilliant analytical work of Desmond and others and present it in a way that we could all understand. He would talk about mothers like the mother here in Columbus, Ohio, who's forced to drive all night to deliver food to people while her twin babies are in car seats in the back of her car. And that's not OK. That's not all right. That's a slave-oriented system. And we've got to name it for what it is. It's not acceptable. He would call us to accountability. It is time to end our low-road capitalism to level the playing field, giving everyone a chance to succeed and not barely survive. And Dr. King would call us, all of us, in the name of God, to a high road of capitalism, where the poor get richer and the rich are required to return their vast capital that they've taken from hardworking people who are crushed in a slave-like system. We would elect leaders who, in, who would make laws happen for this. And economic structures of justice would replace centuries of wrong, slave-driven structures. For the low roads of Georgia and Alabama's cotton kingdom, Dr. King would say, give us the kingdom of God. Take us to the high roads of equality and economic justice. But he wouldn't stop there. He would be deeply concerned about children and education. During the conversations and research I did on my newly released book, The Genius of Ju Justice, I spoke with a number of people who knew and worked with Dr. King closely, including Marion Wright Edelman, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss, Jr., and Susanna Heschel, the only child of Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel, all spoke of Dr. King's genuine interest and presence with children and teens. Jackie, you said this so well today. There was a light in him, and it was in him when he spoke to children and teens. The, the, he, do you, I, I think this is fascinating. I came across this in my research this week. He spoke to more high schools and elementary schools than any preacher. He was 39 when he died, but in any preacher in American history. That's incredible. So he spent a lot of time with children in their schools, in their settings. Sorry, Jackie, you weren't the only one. <laughs> he was everywhere, right? While some people say the children are our future, you don't find them relating children and to, to children and they're not listening to them, but Dr. King did just that. Susanna Heschel recalls that when Mike was with her family in New York City, he would stay at their apartment when he was there, and she remembers him coming in and reading and studying with her. He would sit down next to her to ask her what she was working on, and he'd say, are you working on math tonight, Susanna? And she'd say, yes, I am. And he said, then talk to your dad. His kindness was not lost on her. Marion Wright Edelman recalls the same. His focus on children and families was an inspiration to her. She founded the Children's Defense Fund in 1973 in his memory. Dr. Moss, who worked tirelessly beside Dr. King, was always amazed. He'd be walking along through uh, neighborhoods and stuff, and when Dr. King would see a child, he would stop dead in his tracks, get down on his knees, and begin talking with that child. He loved and cared about children. 
his children, and America's children, and the world's children. So what would he have done for children? I think he would have targeted mothers who have poor prenatal care and post-delivery follow-up and support. He would have made sure that they all had what they needed to bring a healthy child into the world. I know he would have made sure that children born in America make it through their first year of life and aren't a statistic lost before age one. He would have reinvested in Head Start and other programs which give preschoolers a, a leg up, a chance to socialize and learn and grow healthfully and well. And he would have targeted schools to make sure that we guarantee a free and equitable redistribution of resources for schools in urban and rural areas, which are often left behind because they're in the wrong zip codes. He would make sure that the zip code you're in doesn't eliminate you from reaching your highest potential and prepare you for life. I believe he would have helped raise and train this generation of children to use a tool and a weapon that they don't have any exposure to anymore, the weapon of nonviolence. We would learn from him that our greatest weapon is counteracting evil and wrong with our words and our actions on behalf of peace. The only thing that would have been pointed at another human being would have been a hand of love reaching out to manifest what it looks like in a beloved community to hold on to one another. And yes, I believe he would teach our children about racial justice. I think he would bring people together around the often uncomfortable truths about racism and caste in America, which includes thoughtful, analytical, and serious translation of critical race theory, not simply turning CRT into some conversation point to battle back between talking heads on TV, and not to bash people, but to understand what the differences are. 1619 would never be mocked, and it wouldn't be denigrated over and against 1776. Both would have a place to play in our nation's history and story and our deep and growing sense of each other. He would entertain and answer children's questions when reading books about differences and similarities in Dr. Zeus's Sneetches. And all of us would learn from him that it's okay to talk about things like that. And we would learn that when those stories are written and read like the Bible, it's about connecting colorful, metaphorical, miraculous, and often fantastic stories to our stories. That's what's happening. Finally, I believe Dr. King would help us with our diversity and inclusion. Now, I believe this based on one thing. I don't have a lot of evidence. I did a lot of reading about this. But I believe he would have listened to his wife. I certainly would have hoped he would eventually have listened to his wife. And he would have learned from her example. Coretta Scott King was a champion for LGBTQ rights in this community, and for a good reason. For more than 25 years before her death in 2006, she fought tirelessly for gay rights and linked the civil rights movement with the LGBTQ rights movement, believing all the time that while her work was a faithful expression of inclusion and her husband's vision of that, it had to go farther. Mrs. King's first public foray into the gay rights movement occurred in her steady leadership of the 20th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington. Some of you may remember this story. During the run-up to the anniversary, she withstood a tide of social conservatism, and she pledged support for Gay and Civil Rights Act, the Gay and Civil Rights Act that was then before Congress in 1983. It was a groundbreaking bill that would have prohibited discrimination against gays and lesbians in housing, employment, and public accommodations. She faced a lot of fire. Encouraged by gay and lesbian leaders, she also made space for the black poet and openly lesbian Audre Lorde in the anniversary's rallies lineup of speakers. Given the homophobia of some of the civil rights leaders taking part in the rally, King's decision to make room for a lesbian speaker was nothing short of prophetic. So were Lord's words. She said, I am Audre Lorde, speaking for the National Coalition of Black Gays. Today's march openly joins the black civil rights movement and the gay civil rights movement in the struggles we have always shared. 
the struggles for jobs, for health, for peace, for freedom. We marched in 1963, she continued, with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and we dared to dream that freedom would include us, because not one of us is free to choose the terms of our living until all of us are free to choose the terms of our living. Wow. In 2003, down the street at Congregation Tiferet Israel, Coretta Scott King spoke to our brothers and sisters on Broad Street. She said these words, if we can build bridges of knowledge and understanding between peoples of all races and cultural groups, we will sow the seeds of greater unity and prosperity in America. The promotion of diversity and inclusion opens the doors of opportunity for everyone, for all groups. And when this vision of unity is fulfilled throughout the nation, then the America of our noblest ideals will become a reality. A wise man like Dr. King would have listened to Coretta Scott King. I believe that with my whole heart. He knew and expressed that civil rights is never about one race, about one community, about one nation, about any number of subsets of that. He always believed it's about everyone on this planet the protection of rights for those who are unseen, unheard, forgotten, left behind, mistreated, ignored, will mean the protection for everyone in time. Well, I believe Mike would have done all this and more if he were still with us, but he's gone. He's been gone for 55 years. So, it's up to us. It's up to us to be the justice that we want to see in this world. It's up to us to take the dream and carry it forward. It's on us, it's on you and me, to do this work, to bring about a just economic system, a just educational system, an inclusive and diverse and beloved community, here and everywhere. If you don't believe, take some time today to listen and read the writings and the sermons of Mike King, Jr. He will tell you in his own words. And if you really listen, you will be changed. And when you're changed, you will change the world. Amen.